Let's turn to Ukraine, an equally thorny question. Why do you think the U.S., do you think the U.S. tilts towards Ukraine, which I assume you do, and why? Why do you think we tilt towards Ukraine? Is it that same Thomas Jefferson syndrome, promotion of democracy, this is the, the little guy, the hope for democracy that started in the, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union? What, why have we supported Ukraine to this degree? So this is where I got in trouble uh, two years ago and where these lobbyists began to go after me and after Katrina Vanden Heuvel because she published me and they even have been after Jack Matlock and they even attacked Henry Kissinger for, promote, for suggesting we should negotiate. The problem is in the way you formulated the question. <clears throat> and this was the first sentence I wrote that brought the wrath of these people down on me. There is no the Ukraine <clears throat> in the sense of a civilization or a country. There was a post-Soviet Ukrainian state, and it was a mess. And even Ukrainians themselves agree. It was corrupt, it was divided. But historically, and this is not Putin's fault, if you want to blame somebody, blame God, if you're of such a frame of mind, or history, to be more agnostic about it. History created on the territories upon which sat the post-Soviet Ukrainian state, a very divided country, politically, religiously, ethnically, linguistically, culturally. A large part of the country, primarily in central Ukraine and western Ukraine, wanted to become part of Europe. And a large part of the country, primarily in eastern and southern Ukraine, did not want to give up its ancient century-old attachment to Russian civilization, the Russian church, or to its Russian in-laws. Though, of course, if you want to get rid of your in-laws, it would be a good idea to join <laughs> Europe because they're not going to get visas and you'll say, sorry, can't have you for Christmas this year. But this was a profound... Gorbachev has made the point that his wife, Raisa, his beloved wife, <clears throat> was Ukrainian and all his in-laws were Ukrainian. And my wife, Katrina, and I have met more Russians than not who have Ukrainian family, extended family. So <clears throat> you begin with the fact that this was a divided country. And if there was ever a country that needed some kind of federation to stay together, keep people happy, to mediate differences, decentralization, it was Ukraine. We have a federation. Canada has a federation. Germany has a federation. Lots of countries have federations, are federated governments. But in Ukraine, <clears throat> when the crisis began, the president of Ukraine appointed the governors of all the regions, and sometimes even the mayors. Kiev decided, and this was an underlying issue, even the most prosperous parts of Ukraine economically, which was eastern Ukraine, because it was the industrial heartland of Ukraine with the real trade, which was with Russia, paid way too much taxes and got too little back from, from Kiev. So there was this underlying tax issue. We fought a civil war, which was about slavery, but these other issues were embedded in the slave issue. But we fought a civil war. There was no need for Ukraine to fight a civil war over this. So I don't tilt toward Ukraine. I'm aware that there's Ukrainian civil war, and civil wars are the most horrible of wars. And in the modern day, they lead to a proxy war. Yeah, Putin could not let, after February, Donbass, which is the region <clears throat> in eastern Ukraine that's both most industrial and most Russian. Well, not only ethnically Russian, because there are a lot of ethnic Ukrainians for whom, <clears throat> excuse me, Russian is their native language. They can't even speak Ukrainian. You guys know Klitschko, the former heavyweight boxer, guy six foot eight. His brother is now the heavyweight champion of the world. I get him confused. Vitaly and Vladimir. Well, one <clears throat> went back to Ukraine, retired, gave his championship to his brother, went back to Ukraine, became mayor of Moscow. He quickly turned out that his first language was Russian. His second language was German because he had been fighting out of Germany for 15 years. His third language was very poor English, and he could barely speak Ukrainian. But Maidan was about ethno-nationalism. So you couldn't really, and Poroshenko, the president's Ukrainian, but it wasn't very good. What's the point here? More Russians, at least when this all began, the more Ukrainians, no matter where they lived, spoke Russian as their everyday language, fluently. 
grammatically, culturally well, and watch more Russian TV and all the rest than they did Ukrainian. Now, the Ukrainian government's trying to stop that by unwise methods, forcibly. But you can't say you're for or against Ukraine. And that's, of course, the bunk that the State Department's been putting out. You've got to say this is a civil war. Now, you could say, Gloria, if you wanted to do something Americans shouldn't, which side we favor. But we shouldn't do that. And if people ask me, well, which side is worse? <laughs> Kiev or the guys running the rebel operation in Donbass, I revert, when asked which is worse, to the Russian intelligentsia proverb, both are worst. <laughs> both are worst. So Minsk, and Merkel put a lot of political capital on this. Alain at that time had no political capital. He was trying to get some political capital. On these Minsk Accords to resolve the civil war, because if the civil war stopped, the killing would stop. And then, as Churchill liked to say, jaw, 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 don't fight, fight, fight. But this required certain constitutional agreements that could only be passed by the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada in Kiev, which it has refused to pass. And mainly they involve something we all understand, more home rule for Eastern Ukraine. But, and this is what's interesting, <clears throat> a constitutional amendment that devolves what we, we used to call it states' rights, and we're hearing about it from the Republicans now, budgetary, political, and the rest, to Eastern Ukraine, is not specific. It devolves these same rights to Western Ukraine. And whether you like it or not, and whether this is the right word or not, there is a surging neo-fascist movement in Ukraine. They took 30% of the vote in Kiev last week. Klitschko won re-election, but he was forced into a runoff. 30% of the vote, because the candidate ran not on one of the neo-fascist parties, but on some surrogate party. He got 30% is a lot. When people tell me neo-fascist are marginal forces in Ukraine, that's 30% too much for this Jew. Way too much. I can live with 1%. If I know where they are. <laughs> and they running strong in these traditional ultra-nationalist Western provinces of Ukraine. So if the Minsk Accords are fully implemented, and if the decentralized constitution is democratic, you're not going to get virtue everywhere. But at least it puts it to the, the Ukrainian people, to all of them. And one of the conditions, of course, is that there be a complete ceasefire and all foreign troops leave the country. And you say, oh, that's great, the Russians all have to go home. Well, so will the Americans. We are told officially we have 1,200 American soldiers, boots on the ground, in Ukraine, training Ukrainians of, under Kiev's control to fight. If you think it's 1,200, I will give you the George Washington Bridge for a dime. I mean, that's what we're told. But they're running a lot of special op. Uh, operations there. But if this happens, we have to go home too. And the Russians have to go home. But the trouble with sending the Russians home is that really in some fundamental way, leaving military aside, they live there. Like their in-laws or not, they live there. And there's never been a time when there wasn't free passage back and forth from Russia to Ukraine. It's just a stake driven through the heart of a vast family. And now Crimea is, 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 remains an irritant. But for the Europeans, the sanctions are no longer about Crimea. And I assure you Obama doesn't remember why he put sanctions on Putin. I guarantee you, the first time, he, he doesn't remember. But it's all about now the fighting in eastern Ukraine. But Crimea could be solved too, to everybody's reasonable satisfaction. But they won't talk. They don't talk. Will Paris change that? That's a, you, that the pro-Kiev lobbies in America are not merciful in this regard. They just do not care what happened in Paris. 
they came out immediately by saying Putin is the worst terrorist. He's the worst terrorist. 